Well, welcome back. It's good to be here again. Week three, it's, it's still kind of hard to believe that we're actually here doing this thing and what the Lord is forming here and what he's beginning to, to shape in this place and what he's going to do from this place. I'm just really excited to see what God does. Uh, each week I, I wake up just really stunned that God would, would call someone like me to be a part of this and to, to help lead this and serve this, uh, that God would use someone like me. I'm just really, really, really stunned by that and thankful to him uh, that he would create something like this. And I'm really excited to see what the Lord continues uh, to do. So let me just kind of recap uh, the past couple of weeks and set up what tonight's going to hold. So the past couple of weeks, week one, we just hit who we are, uh, where we're going, what we're going to be. Um, again, this is the way you can view this summer is a really long membership process. We're going to know with clarity who Story Church is uh, and what we're going to do and what we hope to see the Lord accomplish in our midst. And so um, it's going to it's going to be kind of a, a long. Um, I already said the dog days of summer. That's how it's going to feel. Uh, I wake up wanting to get into the Bible and start preaching through a book of the Bible uh, and just feeling really restrained that we're not yet there. We will be there. Like, I want to get into Colossians. We're going to get into Colossians real fast this fall. That's where we're going first, just spoiler alert. Um, uh, that's that's my probably my favorite favorite book of the Bible, um, preeminence of Christ. But I don't want to I don't want to go too far on that tangent because I'll just open Colossians one and we'll get started there. Um, but I, I'm just really eager to get to that place where we get to do that. And we get to launch groups and we get to have the Lord's Supper each and every week. But uh, because of a lot of really wise counselors that I try to listen to as best as possible, they say hold the ho- hold your horses. You'll get there. You'll get there, uh, and, and, and it'll be it'll uh, be there in no time. And so uh, that that's what we did week one. Laid out what that looks like going forward. Uh, last week we just di- we just took a deep dive into our mission statement. We know, live, and share the one true story, and we kind of work through the different buckets of each of those um, categories. What does it look like to know the story? What does it look like to live the story? What does it look like uh, to share the story? To share the the gospel. And and so uh, this week, what we're going to do is we're going to begin dive into our core values. So we have four core values as a church, what kind of drives our decision-making process. It's word, prayer, community, and mission. Um, Not fancy, certainly didn't create that ourselves. I mean, that's in the Bible. We believe those are markers of a healthy New Testament local church. Not all of the markers, but some of the key markers. And so tonight, what we're going to do is uh, we are going to dive into our first value, which is uh, word. And so here's how our different value uh, teachings are going to go through the summer. So what we're going to do is we're going to do two parts on each of the values. So it's going to be eight total weeks. The first part is going to kind of be be laying a, a theology of that value. So a theology of the word, a theology of prayer, a theology of community, so on and so forth. And then part two, we're going to bring in, you know, air quotes, industry experts, um, to kind of do a training on the nuts and bolts of those things. So I'm going to, I'm going to be the guy that kind of bores you with like theology and like this, all the, you know, I hope you don't get bored with theology. That, that, let me take that back. I'm going to backtrack on don't get bored with that. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to teach you a theology of why we believe these should be our core values. And then someone's going to come in and give us the tools of how to actually live these things out. And so unfortunately we already did our community training, just how schedules worked out. And we have a video of how that went. Um, and we, we'll get that out to you shortly after doing a teaching on community. Uh, We have three guys come come in from the south and and teach us on on community. Next week, Pastor Chris Lewis from Foothill is going to come in and he's going to uh, give us the tools, the nuts and bolts of uh, of the word, of how to read the word, apply the word, live the word um, in in our everyday life. And I'm just really looking forward uh, to that. As I was... um, as I was typing out this manuscript on Google Docs, he was in, I shared it with him so he knew where I was going this week. And uh, for those of you who use Google Docs, you can see when someone's like highlighting and commenting on your stuff. And, and so he was like highlighting and I finally called him like, dude, am I like doing heresy here? What do you, what, like what's going on? Like, why are you, why are you highlighting everything? He's like, oh no, I'm just pulling out quotes for, for my, I'm like, oh man, when he was, as I was typing, he was following along with me. It felt like, you know, the, the teacher that's monitoring you during, during your prep work. So anyways, what we're going to do is we're going to dive into our first core value that we are a word driven church. Uh, tonight you can kind of think about it as like seminary light. Uh, it's going to be a theology of the word. So there's going to be a lot of big words that I hope to define. And there's going to be a lot of content. It's going to be just drinking from a fire hose, so to speak. So get as much as you can. We are recording Josh. 
Yes, we're recording. Tonight, week one, uh, someone got it on their phone. So we've got that. Week two, we got on an actual a recording device. And I think we sent the audio out on the MailChimp and, and it recorded well. So we're recording again tonight. Um, so if you don't catch some things, we'll have it in place. But, but it's going to be a lot of information. Um, catch what you can and, and catch the audio later. So if you have notes or you like to take notes or whatever else on your phone or, or written down, go ahead and get that ready. What I'm going to do up front is just kind of read a ton of scripture about scripture. Um, read a ton of word about the word of God. And, and, and really, before I jump into that, I, I just want to kind of sober us up a little bit around the fact that like, the creator, transcendent, omnipotent God of the universe has made himself known to us. Like That is incredible. Like, he has made himself known to us. We can understand who he is and, and who we are in light of that. And we can get to know him and worship him rightly. And, and we can read his word. And, and throughout centuries, he has preserved this word for us. And it is now in our hands and on our fingertips. Like, we can have it at any time, at any place. That, that is stunning that a God like that would, would make himself known to us. That's, that's really gracious of him. Uh, John Calvin likens it uh, to a mother who is uh, just kind of lisping to her newborn baby in words that that baby might understand, you know, baba or, or food or whatever else it might be. That's how God makes himself known to us, how gracious it is of him to make himself known to us in that way. So we are a word-driven church I'm going to read nine passages, okay? And I've got slides for each of them, so you don't have to worry about flipping there. It's nine passages about the Word of God. I'm going to give very little commentary on them. Um, these, these passages don't need a ton of commentary. So the first one I've got is Psalm 19, 7 through 11. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be, de be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. The beauty of God's word. This is what the word of the Lord does in our lives, rejoices the heart, endures forever. It's sweeter than honey. This is God's word. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, all scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Acts 17, verse 11 uh, this is after Paul is preaching and, and, and the commentary about those he was preaching to. Now, these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. This is written of the Bereans in Acts 17. And, and their posture in receiving the word with eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was saying was true. Do we receive the word with eagerness? Do we receive the word with eagerness? Do we examine the scriptures daily? Hebrews 4.12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart, the living and active word of God. Isaiah 55.11. So shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. The promise that God's word is not empty and when we preach God's word, his purposes are done in our midst. John 17, 16 through 19. This is Jesus' prayer for his disciples before the cross. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. We grow into Christ's likeness through the word of God. Matthew 4.4, 4, when Jesus is being tempted in the wilderness by Satan, Satan tempts him, and, but he, Jesus, answered, it is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. This is how we live. This is where we get our sustenance, but from the word of God. Romans 10, 14 through 17 says this. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. The missional outflow, the evangelistic outflow of God's word. You can only be saved by hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ and responding to it. You you notice there in, in that text, obedience to the gospel, response to the gospel is not on us. We simply preach it, and God's word does the work. Joshua 1, 8, and 9, final one. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, don't, don't pull any prosperity theology out of that text. That if you just like take the word, you know, like, I'm gonna have success. This is the Lord's definition of success, not ours, not an American definition, right? And the Lord's definition of success is this, fear me, fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. And when we know the word, when we meditate on the word, when it does not depart from us, then we will be prosperous in the way the Lord intends for us to be prosperous. <laughs> So I want to quote all of these up front to just show the value and the need and the beauty and the necessity of God's word in our life. We are a word-driven church because the word of God does the work. If it were up to us to plant a church and to make disciples and to grow disciples without God's word, we would be powerless. We would have nothing. We would have no tools in the tool belt. God's word is both the tools and the tool belt. This is how we have success in planting churches is through preaching God's word. Um, H.B. Charles, a pastor down in Florida, says this. um, Your preaching is not the reason why the word works. The the word is why your preaching works. (laughs) Right? Right? The reason why we can make disciples and plant churches and multiply uh, in our community is from the word of God. Not because we have something creative or fancy or we're cool or whatever else is going on. It's because we have the word. In God's word, there is life. In God's word, there is salvation. In God's word, we are equipped to face daily life and to do the work of ministry. In God's word, we are sanctified and transformed. In God's word, we have hope and joy and satisfaction and life. It is only because of God's work, word that we can do what we want to do. The word does the work. This is why we are a word-driven church. This is why we will dedicate our life to preaching God's word week in and week out as a church. So, so I just wanted to quote that up front to just kind of orient us around the beauty and necessity of God's word in our life. Now, let's dive into a theological category called revelation. Not the book of the Bible, I'm not going to preach Revelation tonight. Uh, We would be here for a couple of days if that were the case. What I want to do is walk us through the theological category of Revelation, the fact that God has revealed himself to us. And the main point here is this. For the Christian, all knowledge is given, and all knowledge of God is revealed knowledge. For the Christian, all knowledge is given, and all knowledge of God is revealed knowledge. So hopefully you know this. Your greatest good in all of your life is knowledge of God. That is your highest good. That is man's highest good is to know God. Your greatest good is not money in the bank account or more possessions or a suffering-free life. Your greatest good is to know God. Jesus in John 17 says this. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they will know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is why your highest good is to know God because eternal life hinges upon knowledge of God. We cannot worship God rightly if we do not know God rightly. 
Knowledge of God brings joy. Faithfulness to God relies upon knowledge of God. Right? And so when you get converted, when the Spirit regenerates you and He gives you a new heart, He gives you new desires, and hopefully that new desire ha- is, is, is wrapped up in this desire to want to be faithful to God who saved you and wanting to worship God rightly. Hopefully that's what God did with your new heart, and I know He did because you're a Christian. You have the Spirit dwelling within you, and the Spirit always wants to point you to Jesus, and the Spirit always wants to point you to knowledge of God, and the Spirit is one that brings about greater knowledge of God through the Word. And so if we want to be faithful to God, we must know God. We must know His Word. Listen to Colossians 1.9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will, in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Knowledge of God's will. Increasing in the knowledge of God. This this will cause us to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, be pleasing to him, to bear fruit in this life. I hope you desire that. I hope you desire that. So knowledge of God is man's highest good. And so for the Christian, all knowledge is revealed knowledge. When we're talking about revealed knowledge of who God is, this is what we mean, the self-disclosure of God, that God is the sole and proper witness to himself. The only foundation of knowledge of God is God himself, and the whole of scriptures presents God to us, and we can know him through the scriptures. So knowledge of God is not sourced in our reason or evidence, or emotions, or feelings, or history, or tradition. Knowledge of God is solely found in the scriptures. God has graciously disclosed himself to us. So when we're talking about theology of revelation, we're talking about this reality that God has made himself known to us. This is our greatest good. And so therefore, we must assume the posture of ones receiving a gift. We have received a great gift in God making himself known to us especially considering eternal life, depends upon knowing God. So we must take on the posture of humility and thankfulness that God would reveal himself to us. So within the category of revelation, there are two different ways to talk about revelation. There's general revelation and special revelation. So when we're talking about general revelation, here's what we mean. God reveals his divine attributes in the world. God has revealed his divine attributes in the world. Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. Now, I was born and raised here in Rancho, and my parents, my my folks' house is is up, uh, tucked into the foothills, and right out the back window, when you're like washing dishes, I don't do much of that, but when I was like filling up the water at the the thing, um, you would look out and you would see these mountains. Now, for, for 23 years, I lived here and I, would, I grew kind of numb to the mountains, right? Um, because they're just always there. You just kind of presume they're there when, when the smog is, is light. And um, then I moved to Texas. And I forgot that mountains were in my backyard. And I forgot that in 45 minutes, I could be at the beach, like looking out at this vast ocean, or you could drive an hour and a half and be in like this desert landscape or, or whatever else it might be. And you get to Texas and it's just like ugly. Like there's nothing. (laughs) Now I would never say that in Texas. When I was preaching in Texas, I was dogging on California. Because, like, people in Texas, if I dogged on Texas, man, I would, I might get shot. I don't know. Um, Now, when we would come back to visit after being in Texas for a few years, we would wake up and, like, look out the window, and you would see God's glory, right? Because God has revealed himself in creation, God has made his divine attributes known. Like you look at those mountains and they're majestic, right? And they're beautiful. And you see God's beauty and you see God's majesty on display there. You see God's power on display when you're watching the waves crash on the shore. And I know you can see beauty in other parts of the world. I just don't, probably not as much as here, right? 
Like we are, we are a blessed people here uh, because God has revealed himself and his glory in many different ways here. So when we're talking about general revelation, that's what we're talking about. That God has revealed his divine attributes in the world. Romans 1, 19 and 20 says this. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. It is plain, it is clear, it is simple, God's glory on display in the world. We are all created like hungry for glory, right? We all, we all, uh, Augustine says we have this, this whole and, and, our heart, and our hearts and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in him. And part of that is like we see God's glory on display everywhere and we're hungry for that glory and we always go to the wrong wells for that glory. And, and yet we, we, we are created for it, right? And it's all around us. We see God's power on display all around us. There is within the human mind and by natural instinct an awareness of divinity within all of us. We are made in the image of God. There's an awareness within us. And so God himself has implanted within us a certain understanding of his divine nature through the world. So here's what we're saying with general revelation. It is real revelation. You can see God through the world. However, it is not salvific revelation. You can't be saved by looking at the mountains long enough. You can't be saved by surfing for a few hours. You can't be saved by going out on a, on a lake. I know a lot of people think, you know, like, that's, it's just me and Jesus on the lake. Well, not, maybe, I don't know. I don't think so. It's not salvific. All right. That's general revelation. Now where we're going to spend the rest of our time is in special revelation. This is, this is where we're, we're getting to the good stuff. When we say special revelation, this is what we mean. God reveals who he is in the word of God incarnate, in the word of God as scripture. Let me define all of that. God reveals who he is in the word of God incarnate, in the word of God as scripture. Here's what we're saying. God has revealed himself in the incarnation of the word of God, Jesus, the son of God, the Logos. Colossians 1, 15 through 20 says this. He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Here's what we're saying, and here's what Colossians 1 is saying, that God has a face and it looks like Jesus. That if you want to know what God is like, who God is, how to experience him, look to Jesus. Jesus is the word of God in flesh dwelling among us. Second, Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 says this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power after making purification for sins. He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high. This is God on display. Jesus Christ is the face of God in our midst. So if you ever have any confusion about who God is or how he is acting or how he is working in your life, look to Jesus Christ and you will know who God is and you will see his very face. God has made himself known in a special way through Jesus Christ. And so what changes between general revelation and special revelation is the fact that special revelation is salvific revelation. It is only through Jesus Christ that we can be saved. Both of those texts, Colossians 1 and Hebrews 1, say this, that Jesus has reconciled to himself all things, making peace by the blood of his cross. And Hebrews 1 says this, that he made purification for sins. Jesus Christ has made a way for us to be saved. God has revealed his redemptive plan for the world through his son, Jesus Christ. 
So the first way we see revelation in a special way on display is through Jesus. But then we can know God through the scriptures. We know God most prominently through the scriptures. So we know God through creation. We know God through Jesus Christ. But the, the, the primary way God has equipped us to know who he is and how he's acting in the world is through his word, is through the Bible. And so everything, when we're talking about the Bible and knowledge of God and revelation of God, it all flows downhill from the fact that the scriptures are inspired by God. I read 2 Timothy 3.16 earlier that all scripture is God-breathed. Theonoustos is the word there for God-breathed, which is just a way to say it is inspired, inspired by God. It is inspired by God. And, and when we're talking about inspiration of the scriptures, we're talking about authorship of scriptures. If we are con convinced that God is the author of the scriptures, then we will submit to the scriptures. We will love the scriptures. We will believe the scriptures. We will obey the scriptures. So when we talk about knowing God through the Bible, you must first be convinced that the scriptures are inspired by God before you come to the, the, the scriptures, before you approach the scriptures rightly. R.C. Sproul says this, the Bible is called the word of God because of its claim, believed by the church, that the human writers did not merely write their own opinions, but that their words were inspired by God. The word inspiration is a translation from the Greek word meaning God breathed. God breathed out the Bible. Just as we must expel, bre expel breath from our mouths when we speak, so ultimately scripture is God speaking. Do you believe that when you are reading the words on this page that you are hearing God speak? This is God making himself known to us, speaking to us. 2 Peter 1, 19 through 21 says this. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture, no Scripture, comes from someone's interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Scripture is inspired by God. They were carried along. The authors were carried along by God to write the Scriptures. This is what we call verbal plenary inspiration. Very big word, theological category, just means this, that these are man's words and God's words inspired by God together. And it has everything to do with the authorship of scripture, that they are fully divine, fully man, and without error. What does that sound like? Jesus, fully divine, fully man, without error. This is God's word to us. So we must first confess as a word-driven church that we believe the scriptures are inspired by God and he is speaking to us, making himself known. Next, we're going to jump into different characteristics of the Bible, different characteristics of the scriptures, the authority, the inerrancy, the sufficiency, the clarity, and necessity. I'm going to walk through each of those categories for us. Because when we say we're a word-driven church, this is what we're talking about. This is what we're submitting to, that we believe God's word is authoritative, inerrant, sufficient, clear, and necessary for us. So first, the authority of the Bible. When we're saying the Bible's authoritative, we're saying this, that God's word is final and it demands our belief and obedience. God's word is final and it demands our belief and obedience. Everyone in this room has some form of authority. That's true. We all have some form of authority. And when we are saying we want to be a word-driven church, what we're saying is God's word and God himself stands over us. We don't stand over him. We don't give our own opinions or our own thoughts. We give God's word to each other. Credibility of doctrine from the scriptures. Knowledge of God, the credibility of your knowledge of God is not established until you are persuaded beyond doubt that God is its author, that God is the author of scriptures. What the Bible says, God says. What the Bible says, God says. The word of God is authoritative. A text carries the weight of the authority of the author. Now, we live in a, a kind of a post-truth society, right? And, and there's this kind of weird thing raging in literary circles about authorial intent. You've probably heard of that before. And here's what's going on. There's, there's some people um, that we'll call camp number one, um, people that are 
normal and use their brains. They believe that the author decides what the meaning of the text is and that we submit to what that author says. So if you're reading Shakespeare, you want to know what Shakespeare is saying. You don't get to determine what Shakespeare is saying. Authorial intent. Now, camp number two over here, a little less normal and decide to turn their brains off. They believe that we get to determine what anything says. So what Shakespeare wanted to say, well, we could just kind of throw that out the window. I get to determine what Shakespeare is saying in Hamlet. He wrote Hamlet, right, Jana? Yeah. Just being sure. Went on a bridge there. Um, so when it, the reason why I say that is because so many of us, whether implicitly or explicitly, we, we approach the scriptures and we say, well, I get to determine what this means. If you're ever in a Bible study and the Bible study goes like this, look around the circle and say, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to me? Like, get out of there. Because the text can never mean what it never meant to the original hearers of the scriptures, those who originally received the scriptures. If, it, if they were to hear our interpretation of the scriptures and think, wow, that's way out of left field, like, wait a minute, we'd be way off, right? And so what we want to do is agree with them that God is the author of the scriptures. He gets to intend for us what the scriptures mean, and we just submit to it whether we like it or not. Like, I don't know about you, there's a lot of places I get to in scripture and I'm like, man, I really don't like that. I wish that wasn't in there. Like, if you don't have that moment, you're probably not reading the scriptures honestly. Or you're probably not bringing the full weight of your, your sin before the scriptures because God's confronting your humanness, your fallenness, your flesh in the scriptures. And if you're never confronted with, gosh, I don't like that that's in there, but you still submit because you love God more, then you're probably not reading the scriptures honestly. So when we're talking about the authority of the Bible, this is what we mean, that the word of God is either completely authoritative for everyone everywhere, or the Bible is not authoritative for anyone anywhere. And we believe at Story Church that the Bible is completely authoritative for all of us. The authority from, at Story Church doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from my sending churches. It doesn't come from the office of elder. The, the authority at Story Church comes from the word of God. Everything flows downhill from the word of God. So that's what we're going to submit to, even when we don't like it. Second characteristic of the Bible. So first we have the authority of the Bible. Next, we have the inerrancy of the Bible. So what we mean, that God's word is wholly true and trustworthy in everything it claims about what was, what is, and what will be. God does not contradict himself. There might be difficulties in scripture, but that doesn't mean that God is wrong. God cannot be wrong. Do you believe? God cannot be wrong. So even though the Bible has difficulties, we affirm that the scriptures are inerrant that they are without error because God is without error. They are true because God is true. They are right because God is right. So when we're saying inerrancy, we're not saying that inerrancy equals inerrant interpretation. It has nothing to do with your ability to perfectly and without error interpret the scriptures. That's why we have resources and we have each other and we have church history to learn and to study and to grow together and to repent when we're wrong and to embrace what is right. So it has nothing to do with your interpretation or someone else's interpretation. And don't, we, we, we should not project upon our own fallenness. We should not project our fallenness upon the scriptures. We have errors. The scriptures do not have errors. There can be no errors in God's speech. Therefore, we believe the scriptures are inerrant. So we trust the complete truthfulness of scripture because we trust the complete truthfulness of God. We trust the complete truthfulness of scripture because we trust the complete truthfulness of God. So first, we're a word-driven church because we believe in the authority of the scriptures. Second, we believe in the inerrancy of the scriptures. And then third, we believe in the sufficiency of the Bible. Now, this is the category that um, most of us probably, again, whether we're consciously aware of it or not, we kind of buck up against this category. Here, here's what I mean by that. If we believe that the scriptures are sufficient for all things pertaining to life and godliness, why do we so often go to different sources for the answers? Why do we so often go to other places to find the answers and to be sufficient in our lives? 
So again, we believe that the Bible is sufficient. And this is the doctrinal idea that God's revelation of himself, the way of salvation, and instructions for a life of faith and obedience are found in the Bible. Scripture is not lacking in anything necessary for true belief and obedience. At the heart of the doctrine of the sufficiency of Scripture is the premise that God is knowable through Scripture and that we desire to follow him in all of life. God adequately ministers to his people through the scriptures. And so we believe scripture is enough because God is enough. Scripture is enough because God is enough. Herman Bavink, a reformed theologian, says this, that, that we believe, when we're saying that the, the sufficiency of scripture is a thing, that we believe scripture is the ongoing rapport between heaven and earth, between Christ and his church, between God and his children. It does not just tie us to the past. It binds us to the living Lord in the heavens. It is the living voice of God. The scriptures are sufficient for all things pertaining to life and godliness. Now, what we're not saying is that scriptures are exhaust, exhaustive revelation of all things. So here, here's a question. Can the scriptures um, diagnose cancer? The answer is no to that, but the scriptures do not intend to diagnose cancers, cancer. But what the scriptures can do in the midst of suffering is give us hope in the midst of that diagnosis, to not run from Jesus, but run to Jesus, to know God as healer, to approach God as healer, to plead with God to heal. So what we're saying is so there, there are some things that Scripture is silent on, and that's okay. We want to go to the Scriptures for all things that they are sufficient for, which is everything pertaining to true belief and obedience and godliness. Wayne Grudem says this, the idea that the scripture contained all the words of God he intended his people to have at this stage of redemptive history and that it now contains all the words of God we need for salvation, for trusting him per perfectly, and, by, and for obeying him perfectly. So again, we believe scripture is sufficient and therefore we do not stand in need of more revelation. We are not needy people. God has given us all that we need for true life and true obedience. So first, we're a word-driven church because we believe in the authority of the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible, the sufficiency of the Bible, and then fourth, the clarity of the Bible. Here's what we're talking about when we say the clarity of Scripture. That Scripture so clearly reveals the central truths of Christianity and the gospel that the regenerate mind, the believer under the teaching and guidance of the Spirit, can receive and understand revelation. Scripture is clear when rightly read, illuminated by the Spirit, with a heart willing to hear. Does that describe you when you come to Scripture? Are you someone who has a heart that's willing to hear and be changed? And, and, and again, Hebrews 4, that you're allowing the Word of God to be living and active, penetrating every aspect of your life, changing every aspect of your life. Are you pleading with the Spirit to illuminate the Scriptures to you? So, so here, here, here's an encouraging thing from the Bible. Peter says that Paul is hard to understand. I have a hard time understanding parts of Scripture. Um, and so when we're talking about clarity of Scripture, we're not talking about we have the ability to just open it and boom, like that's incredibly clear to me because like sometimes studying Scripture is hard work and it requires discipline and diligence and a lot of study and resources and digging and that's okay because we have the Spirit, we have all the tools we need to be taught and guided by the Spirit to understand the Scriptures. So the knowledge of which is necessary, the knowledge of God which is necessary for salvation is spelled out clearly upon the pages of Scripture. So some of our hurdles to understanding the Scriptures clearly. Let's walk through some of those hurdles for us. So, so our first hurdle to understanding the Scriptures clearly, because sometimes when you hear clarity of the Bible, you're like, man, like, that should be easier than that. It should, my, my devotional time this morning should have been a lot easier than it was. I didn't understand so much there. So let's talk about some of the different hurdles. First, first hurdle is your own sin. So sin blinds, and it's hard to see clearly when you're blind. Right? You can't see clearly when you're blind. And so if sin blinds, then we must ask God to help us repent of our sin, to, to put to death our sin, and to come to the Scripture with, with pure eyes and eyes that can see. And he, only he has the ability to do that. And so we repent and we ask him to help us see clearly the Scriptures. The, the second hurdle to understanding the Scriptures clearly is our cultural distance. 
right? So, so this was written to people 2,000 to 4,000, 6,000 years ago. I don't know how you age everything. Um, and the world has changed drastically since then, right? And so sometimes understanding the metaphors or the, the analogies or different things that are going on, they're hard to understand, and so sometimes we can't understand the Bible clearly because we are so distant from the original readers and, and, and authors of the scripture, but that doesn't mean we're without the resources to go and understand. So again, God has blessed us with so many resources. And then our third uh, kind of hurdle to understanding clearly of scripture is that we are just really poor readers. We are really bad readers, right? And we are increasingly bad readers where we can't get past 140 character clips Right? We get bored or we get distracted. I mean, even if you watch newspaper columns, they're getting increasingly short. Like the op-eds on the back page are like now limited to like 250 words. There's like nothing. They used to take up the whole back page. Um, and now we're just like, we are such terrible readers. So let me equip you. If you want to, um, if you want to read the Bible more clearly and you're having a hard time with it, go buy a book that's called How to Read a Book. Go buy that book. Read that book and you'll learn how to read right um, and, and, and read clearly. But there's, there are some disciplines that come with reading, including knowing the context and, 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 and taking, cue, or taking cues of, of what different analogies are being strung throughout uh, or illustration is being strung throughout a story. Or, and, and you'll learn about genres, right? So the way you read like, narratives is different than the way you read prophecy. You just, like, we have to be disciplined readers to understand the scripture clearly. So when we're saying that the scripture is clear, it means that we are reading and knowing God clearly under the illuminated light of the Holy Spirit. Psalm 119, 130 says this, the unfolding of your words gives light. It imparts understanding to the simple. So the Bible is authoritative. It's inerrant. Uh, it is clear and it is sufficient. And then finally, fifth, it is necessary. Scripture is necessary to know who God is, what he has done, and how we are to respond to him. I just read Romans 10, 13 through 17 earlier. Like, how are you to respond unless someone preaches the gospel to you, unless someone preaches the word of Christ to you? So knowledge of God, knowledge of the gospel is necessary. So that's why we need the Bible. Maintaining a spiritual life life before God, a, a vital life, a growing life before God it requires the word of God. The word of God is necessary. You cannot grow unless you know the Bible and you are knowing the Bible. The Bible is necessary for making sense of this world, right? Like how no belief system outside of Christianity can adequately explain suffering. How can you make sense of the world apart from the Bible? You can't. You can't make sense of suffering unless you have the scriptures informing you of suffering. So by, the Bible is necessary for life, for knowledge of the gospel, for growth in the Lord, for making sense of this world. So when we're talking about characteristics of the scripture, here's what we're saying. The Bible is authoritative because God is authoritative. The Bible is trustworthy because God is trustworthy. The Bible is the standard because God is the standard. The Bible is sufficient because God is sufficient. And the Bible is clear because God is clear. And we are a word-driven church standing underneath those things, asking God to help us submit to those things to submit to his authority, to submit uh, to his trustworthiness, to submit to him being the standard, not us, not our sin, to submit to him to being the sufficient one that provides all things for us and to submit to him as the one who has made himself clearly known to us. And so let's, let's talk for a second about kind of scripture, Bible reading, knowledge of God and discipleship. So I'm just gonna walk through that real quick. Kind of skip ahead a couple of slides there, Josh. Next one. So when we're talking about scripture and discipleship, here's what we're talking about. Knowing and hearing God. The scriptures are necessary for knowing and hearing God. We need to be really careful with our language like this. God said, or the Lord told me. Be really careful with that, unless you're quoting this. Um, John MacArthur, and this is just, this is just tongue in cheek, right? I'm just gonna, I understand God speaks. But John MacArthur says this. If you want to know God, read the Bible. If you want to hear God speak, read the Bible out loud. Okay. 
I got in trouble for that quote one time. So, but John MacArthur said it, so I'm I'm allowed to repeat it. it. Wasn't original to me. So, okay, scripture and discipleship, knowing and hearing God. If you want to hear God, and I hope as a Christian you desperately want to hear the voice of God. If you want to approach the scriptures and you can grow as a disciple, you can only grow by by following that which you know. Next, we're talking about Bible literacy, biblical literacy. I kind of touched on this a couple of weeks ago that we, even though we have so much Bible at our fingertips, are a woefully biblically illiterate people. And really, that just says so much about our hearts and how we view God. Um, and, and how, how or we're just totally like not thankful that he would give him, himself to us through the scriptures. But, but here's the truth. Like, just read the Bible a lot. If you want to grow as a disciple, just read the Bible a lot. You can never exhaust the riches of this Bible. The greatest saints in church history have never used up all the gold in the scriptures, and neither can we. D.L. Moody says this, I never saw a fruit-bearing Christian who was not a student of the Bible. So few grow because so few study. I never saw a fruit-bearing Christian who was not a student of the Bible. So few grow because so few study. If you feel stagnant, if you feel like you've hit a wall, if you feel like you're not growing, if you feel like you have this besetting sin that that constantly holds you back and hinders you, if you feel like you're not seeing God or sensing God or savoring God, then read the Bible. Just keep pressing on in the scriptures. When we're talking about scripture and discipleship, we're talking about participating in God's story, participating in the Christian story. Abraham Heschel says this, the Bible is not a book to be read, but a drama in which to participate. We are caught up in a divine story, story church. um, and, And we participate in that story rightly by knowing God in his word. You can only answer the question, what am I to do, if you have already answered the prior question of what story do I find myself a part of? You can only answer the question, what am I supposed to do, if you know the answer to the question, what story am I a part of? And we are a part of the greatest, most grand story in human history. We are caught up in that story, and we know our role in that story by knowing God's word. And then fourth, we talk about beholding God in Scripture. You become like that which you behold, right? Whatever you worship determines what you look like. What you believe determines how you behave. We've talked about this a couple of times before. And so if we want to become like God, if we want to behave like God, if we want to if we want to grow into Christ-likeness, which I hope you do, if you don't want to grow into Christ-likeness, like don't be a part of this church. Um, seriously. I mean that. Thanks, Jay. But, like, the, the, the scripture, it, yes, it is God's gracious self disclosure of himself to us, but it is also his ongoing self presentation of who he is and how he's working in the world. Communication from God is meant to create communion with God. Communication from God is meant to create within us communion with God. So we treat the scripture now as the face of God and we melt in its presence. We melt in the presence of the scripture. The risen Christ is speaking to us by his word. And his word is not one of the competing voices struggling to be heard. It is the infinitely authoritative and incomparable word of God. So we must behold God in the scriptures and we will become like God as we behold him. So when we're talking about scripture and discipleship and knowing God and and, and being a word-driven church, these are the things we're talking about as we submit to the characteristics of the Bible, as we submit to the God of the Bible, the author of the Bible. This is how we participate as disciples with him through his word. So how can you expect expect, uh, being a word-driven church to kind of flesh out here at, at Story Church? Uh, in a number of ways, but, but most prominently, uh, we, we wanna, we'll put that in our category of know the story. We talked about this at length last week. It's one third of our mission statement, know the story, right? Know, live, share. Know the story. So when we're talking about knowing the story, we're talking about knowing God through his scripture. So it's gonna be Bible teaching and preaching every single week. And, and, and like I, to, I told you guys, like I'm eager to get to that place. When I just quoted about a half hour ago, when I quoted Colossians 1, 15 through 20, like I wanted to start preaching it. I mean, that text is rich. Like the fullness of God is pleased to dwell in Christ. 
Like, I'm ready to get there and to talk about that and for us to worship God together. And, like, I'm, right now I'm, like, about to get there. I'm restraining myself. I hope you can feel it. Like, oh, I'm ready. But every single week, like, you are going to hear the Bible. Whether it's me or someone else. And, and I said this, and I'll probably say it every single week that we gather, that if we give people our word, we give them death. If we give them God's word, we give them life. And we want to give people life and we want to give each other life and that only comes through God's word. And so if any one of us ever veers from God's word like, and, and we just start talking about our own opinions, our own thoughts or, or you know, cultural events or whatever else, like, just fire me. Like, don't let me come back up here unless I'm ready to give you God's word. So Bible preaching and teaching every week. We're going to have Bible and theology classes. Again, I previewed this last week where we're going to equip you um, in basic hermeneutic classes. Like next week is just like a taste of what that'll look like. Chris is going to come. I'll just preview it now. Chris is going to come and and he's going to walk us through what does it look like to interpret the scriptures. What does it look like to observe the scriptures, interpret the scriptures, apply the scriptures? He's going to talk to us about cultivating habits in our life that revolve around the scriptures. How do we prioritize the scriptures? How do we love the scriptures? So he's going to give us some of the basic tools of now of approaching God's word rightly. And we're going to continue to do that. We want to do that you know, semester in and semester out where we're equipping people with all these resources to know God in his word. We want to have Bible classes where we're actually like just verse by verse teaching through a book of the Bible. Um, I, heard, I heard a story that um, Scott, he's not here. Scott's not here, so I can kind of make fun of him. Um, don't tell him I did that. Scott's, Scott's home group, like he taught through Isaiah verse by verse. Is that, that's, yeah, there's a lot of nodding head. Like, <laughs> like that's, that's funny, but I love it. Like, that, that's the type of classes we want to have. And, and, like, the Lord has blessed us with this campus that we can open this place up on, like, a Tuesday night and say, Scott's teaching Isaiah every Tuesday night for 12 weeks. Come on and come get into that. Because, like, I don't know about you, but when I read Isaiah at times, I'm like, oh, that's going to take me a while to get through that stanza. Not, not just the chapter. Like, I stop at a stanza. I'm like, oh, gosh, I don't, I don't get it. I'm going to have to go get some help with this. So we have Bible and, and theology classes. And then this is like distant future, but that's, I'm always thinking distant future. Um, we want to have some type of academy or institute in the local church where we, we're equipping people um, on like a level of Bible college or seminary. Like, to, like we're recovering discipleship in the Bible at the local church. I, I'm, I, that's not original to me. That's just my, my two sending churches do this in phenomenal ways. And we just want to continue that and just grab the baton and keep doing it somewhere else. Because like the, the fact that seminary exists means the local church didn't even do its job in the first place. And we want to bring that back. And I'm a seminary, I've given a lot of money to Western Seminary in Portland. Well, someone else gave them a lot of money, but I'm thankful for that. And so we want to do that. And, and when, you're, when, you're, when we're counseling, like we don't want to give you secular mumbo jumbo. We want to give you God's word. Like when we are praying with you and for you, we want to pray God's word over you. His word is more effective than my word. When we are in group, we want to encourage one another, not with our own opinions, but with God's word. Um, I, I said this last week in my sermon, but man, when I'm like, when I'm like down, right, or I'm, I'm sad or whatever else, um, what I don't need is someone to come up to me and tell me like, you got it in you. You're a champion. You can overcome. Because that's all bull crap. <laughs> Baloney. Baloney, getting better. <laughs> Thanks, Jasmine. I got the thumbs up. She told me last week I was too soft. Um, she told me to come back harder. You don't want that. Now, like, I don't need someone to tell me that. I need someone to encourage me from the word. And here's what the word tells me. When I'm down, when I'm sad, when I'm suffering, I don't have it in myself. I'm not a champion. I can't overcome this under my own strength, but God can. And God in me can, and God in my community can, and we can be, and even if the suffering never goes away, and even if the sadness never goes away, that doesn't change God's goodness and God's plan for my life. And I need someone to speak that to me, and the only way we can do that properly is through God's word. Don't listen to that secular baloney. I said it right that time. Don't let the world disciple you. you. Let God's word disciple you. 
So that's how we can, those are just a few, of, and, and I mean, I'm just thinking about what's going on over in the kids' space uh, right now. Like, they're getting God's word. Sarah's teaching a lesson. Or is it Megan? It's Sarah. Sarah's teaching a lesson right now with the word. And, and, and here's something that's, like, really perplexing to me. I've never been a youth pastor, and you could probably tell why. Um, but, like, w- why do we feel the need to create like laser shows and really cool programs for kids and we don't give them the word of God and then they graduate high school and we're like, hmm, they left the church, I wonder why. Well, because they went to big church and realized, man, this guy's preaching the Bible, I don't really, that's kind of boring. And then they're like, where's the fog and the laser and all those cool things? But, but here's a question I've always had, like why can high school students learn like chemistry and calculus but we feel like they can't learn the Bible? Like what's, like, what's wrong with us? And so, like, starting as early as possible, we want to teach the Bible all the way up through um, the oldest among us. And so that's what we are going to do. We are going to know God through his word and submit to his word. We are a word-driven church. Now, um, Katie read my manuscript, and she's like, when you said this was seminary, like, you weren't lying. This is seminary, light. Um, but, but that's okay. Like, we can take it. We're adults here, Right. Um, we can handle this. Um, but, but I do want to encourage you, if, if you're like kind of overwhelmed or you're looking at this and you're like, gosh, man, I'm really, really terrible. Like I don't read God's word. I don't love God's word. Uh, when I do read it, I don't understand it. Let me just say like, that's okay. Let's grow together. Let's take baby steps together. I don't care where you are on the spectrum of following Jesus or how much you understand the scriptures or how many degrees you have that that happened in in a seminary location. We need each other and we need to point each other to the scripture and we need each other to help understand the scripture. And what we hope to do and cultivate here at Story Church is the ability that no matter where you do find yourself on that spectrum, we can help take you along on that next step. And so maybe this week, it's just you prioritize time in the scripture. Like, you can, you don't need sleep as badly as you think you do. Sleep is good. It's important. But, like, you need God's word. Man lives by the word of God alone. Um, And sleep and food and oxygen and other things. But you need God's word. Prioritize it this week. Study it. Discipline yourself to to ask the scriptures questions, to know God, to to look up other resources, to listen to sermons, and, and to hear God's word preached. So take the next step and then stay the course. Just stay the course and take that next step. When you hit a wall, take that next step and stay faithful and grab the hands of someone around you and say, come, come with me. And when I'm feeling lazy or tired or whatever else it is, you pull me along. And when you're feeling lazy or tired or whatever else, I'll pull you along. Like we need God's word so desperately. And so here, like as, as just kind of like a promise that we are going to equip you. Like, we, I'll do a little book giveaway again. Because um, that's, that's just who, I read a lot, and I love giving books away. Um, and I want you reading good books. So if, uh, ladies in the room, let me just, I'm just gonna call someone out. Um, if you read a book recently called Girl, Wash Your Face, go burn that book. <laughs> and I'm gonna give you good books. Um, to replace it on your shelf. Or if you have anything written by someone named Joel Osteen or Joyce Meyer or whatever else, I hope you're using it as a fire starter kit. Um, And and so let's get good content into the life of Story Church. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna be the guy that's the, the chief uh, of trying to seed that. And so I've got three books um, that have to do with this idea of knowing God um, through the Word. So the first one is Sound Doctrine, written by Bobby Jameson. Guy, guy out at Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. This series, um, it's the Nine Marks Building Healthy Churches series. There's probably like 14 or 15 in the series now. Phenomenal series. Cheap books, small, easy to read, but really, really good. Um, so this one is about sound doctrine. The next one, um, this is probably, outside of, of the Bible, the most influential Christian book I've ever read, which is called Knowing God by J.I. Packer. Read this book if you've not read this. Even if you don't get it tonight, um, go read it. J.I. Packer's phenomenal theologian. And he, he begins with the first part of the book, the, the study of God through his word. And then he works through different categories about who God is, how he works in this world, his attributes, and those kind of things. And then the, the third one is firmly planted by a guy named Robbie Gallaty, a pastor out in Nashville. Um, and it's a whole book about, about cultivating a, a faith that's rooted in Christ through the scriptures. 
How do we grow to be like Christ? How do we mature in Christ? How do we know Christ rightly? And so these are the three books. Um, and I'm, gonna just, I'm just going to do it again. I did it week one, and I'll do it again this week. I'm going to go out on a limb, and, and if there's silence, I'm going to be okay with it. But it's going it's to have to be three people are going to have to stand up and, and share something encouraging that the Lord's done in your life. Some, some story you want to steward or, or some way the Lord's been faithful to you or, 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 or whatever. Some, yeah, just something that the Lord's doing in your life. And if you share a testimony, you'll get to, to pick which book you want.